Howdy, and welcome to the Bikes for Death podcast. Today, live and in living color here on YouTube. Every once in a blue moon, I decide to release the video portion of my podcast. And today, I have a special guest in Ryan Van Duzer, who's a YouTube star. He's all the rage for bikepacking on YouTube. And so in his honor, I decided to release the video version as well because I know you're used to seeing his face and you probably wanna see his face for this one too. So I decided I would dust off my editing equipment and uh, give this one a go. I hope you appreciate it. I hope you enjoy this episode. Also along for today's conversation is Matt Mason, who's the event director for the Danger Bird which is held on the Monumental Loop Trail that he developed in and around Las Cruces, New Mexico. This year, they also had a bikepacking summit that was held the day prior to the Danger Bird, and Ryan Van Duzer and I both attended. He rode the route, and I was there working, documenting it. I got to ride some of it. But today's episode, we're going to get a chance to get to know Ryan a little bit better and hear his experiences on the Monumental Loop, as well as hear from Matt Mason about his thoughts from his perspective as a race director and what we might expect in coming years. I appreciate both of these guys coming on the podcast, sharing their time and their knowledge with us today. And if you like bikepacking content and you would like to hear more stories like this, you can check out all the episodes over at bikesordeath.com. And of course, if you want to support this work, you can find out how at patreon.com forward slash bikesordeath. Now, without further ado, let's get to my chat with Ryan and Matt. You know, kids and life and you know, I got all kinds of excuses, but I just haven't made it a priority to yeah. do what I need to do. Yeah. Well, you also <laughs> did just put on a pretty large event. Yeah, and I wrote it in three days. I mean, it's not like I'm in horrible shape, but I'd like to be better. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. What about you, Ryan? Um, you came off the danger bird and went straight to the Western Wildlands route, so maybe you're yeah. in the best shape out of us all. I, yeah, I'm in pretty good shape. I did a lot of running this summer, too. I did the Leadville 100 and some other ultras, so I'm ready to chill out. I'm, I'm toast. <laughs> is this going to be your off season? Yeah, for sure. Nice. So you said you ran the Leadville 100? Yeah. Oh, that's that's pretty epic. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually I'm more of a runner as far as like being good at a sport. I'm I'm a much better runner than I'm a cyclist. Oh, interesting. Well, yeah. we'll definitely get into that. Um jumping ahead, but that's definitely interesting. Um and with that, yeah. Welcome, Ryan Van Duzer and Matt Mason to the Bikes for Death podcast. Podcast, uh, Matt, you're back for a second time, so we'll just skip right over you and start right with Ryan. <laughs> no, uh, actually, I want both of you to introduce yourself. Um, Ryan, why don't you start? But both of you say, you know, who you are, where you're calling in from, and finish the sentence. I'm the person who. All right. My name is Ryan Van Duzer. I am calling in from or zooming in from Boulder, Colorado. And I am the person who always travels with a can of beans. <laughs> nice. All right, Matt, what about you? Uh, my name is Matt Mason. Uh, I'm calling in from Las Cruces, New Mexico. And I'm just a person. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what I do. Um, just a person. Do people stuff. Sometimes do people with things. Other, sometimes with other people, sometimes by myself, but just people stuff. Just like eating and breathing, just normal yeah. stuff, put on clothes. Regular, regular things. Yeah. Laundry. That's why I like you. You're just a regular guy. I'm a regular no, guy. No, no glam here. The real deal. That's it. <laughs> um, well, you, you uh, kind of sold both of yourselves short, but we'll give you an opportunity to make up for that. Um, you know, for anyone who doesn't know, Matt has been on the podcast before I went up and rode part of the danger bird with him. And I highly recommend you check out that full episode. Um, so I thought we'd start with Ryan and get to know him a little bit, Ryan, this being your first time on the, on the show. I have to admit that I'm not a big YouTube watcher, so I wasn't, uh, you weren't on my radar. Obviously I'm a podcast guy and, uh, 
no 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 shade though but it was pretty funny i was talking to greg hardy with rockgeist and i happened to mention that you were coming on the show i don't remember why it came up but his girlfriend was in the room and she overheard the conversation and she damn near passed out with <laughs> excitement uh it was it was pretty funny i was actually trying to get her to come on the episode because she was fangirling so hard um and she was thinking about coming on the episode to ask you a few questions personally but uh i think she she got nervous um but yeah you've got uh, 135,000 like followers on on youtube and and i scrolled through your content you've got a mass amount of content with which as a content creator i really respect i'm like damn this guy's put in the work so i was wondering if you could just you know uh you know again i, I don't haven't met you yet too well we actually got to meet at the monumental loop briefly but why did you get into making videos was, was it intentional or did you just kind of fall into it yeah, so I've always loved bicycles. I've actually never had a car in my life. When I was a young boy, I vowed never to drive. I was, I've always been very environmentally uh, focused. And um, that was kind of the start of it as a young kid, just riding my bike everywhere. Fast forward to college, I got a degree in broadcast journalism. I've always been somewhat of a storyteller through different mediums. And I learned how to be essentially a local news anchor. And I didn't want to do that. That wasn't my style. I graduated from college and joined the Peace Corps. And I lived in Honduras for two years. Amazing experience. And when I finished my service, I thought the best way to get home would be to ride my bicycle. I didn't want to just jump on an airplane and be home in a matter of five hours. I thought that would be serious reverse culture shock. So I wanted to sit on my bike and think about life and dream toward the future. And that's exactly what I did. I rode for three months for all the way from Honduras through Central America and Mexico and back home to Boulder, Colorado. And that ride kind of opened up my eyes to the world and the, the goodness of strangers and people inviting me into their homes and truckers pulling over and helping me. And, you know, we hear a lot of bad things about Mexico and the media, but down there on the ground on my bike, I've only had amazing experiences. And when I was riding home, I had a little Sony Handycam and I filmed the entire adventure. This was way before digital cameras. This was still on DV tapes. And when I got home, I edited a short five minute, you know, teaser for the adventure and I submitted it to the Travel Channel. And they played it on national TV. And from that moment, I was like, okay, I want to do this. I want to be a host or I want to tell stories. I want to take the audience on adventures. I want to inspire people to challenge themselves. And that's essentially a very condensed version of what I do now. I worked in the TV world for many years. I worked for the Travel Channel, did some stuff with Discovery Channel. Um, but five years ago, I decided that YouTube was the medium. I wanted to create my own audience and create videos that I put, could put my heart and soul into and share with the world and really hopefully inspire people to get off their couches and, and do something hard. And, you know, that can be, you know, a five kilometer ride or it can be across the country. You know, we, we all have different limits for what hard means. And that's quick. That's, that's, that's me in a nutshell, really quick. Yeah, that's a great, no, that's a great nuts, nutshell. It's, it's fascinating. And, <laughs> I, I, it kind of piggybacks on the next question I wanted to ask you was, you know, I mean, you've you've kind of been poking and prodding in, in different ways at this and coming at it from different angles, but landed on YouTube. Um, what stories are you attracted to um, and, and, and what can people find? Like, what are you hoping to showcase on your channel? My favorite thing, and I'm sure a lot of bike packers would say this, my favorite thing when I'm out there on the road is meeting people, making new friends. And I highlight a lot of their stories on my channel. You know, like a lot of people I meet, I'll sit and chat with them on the side of the road or wherever I am in the middle of nowhere with a farmer or a rancher or where I'm somewhere in Baja, Mexico. And I ask them if I can film their story a little bit and, and, and talk to them. And my audience really loves to meet these people. You know, they, it's pretty cool. If you watch media, traditional media, it's pretty scary, you know, the nightly news is depressing. It's violence. It's bad news. It's scary. 
I want my channel to be a place where people can go and feel better about the world and feel better about the humans who live in this on this planet. And so that's really what I try to focus on. Of course, there's the the uh, aspect of adventure and pushing yourself and challenge and all that stuff. But really what ties it all together are the human stories. Yeah, no, I like that. It's interesting. I've as I've gone on my own journey with becoming a storyteller, I've been having this conversation a lot with people about how I like to bike pack into these communities and actually like talk to the clerk at yeah. the gas station in this small ass town or whatever. And because they're, you know, they're equally curious about us, these mm -hmm. strangers that are riding their bikes and weird places. And I think it's a great way to uh, maybe do some healing, you know, and, and to show the world that we're all just people and we may vote differently or whatever, but you know, when you're in the middle of nowhere on a bike ride, a lot of that stuff kind of goes away and you can just talk to people. One of my favorite comments that I get, and I get it quite a bit, is from viewers outside of the United States. And they'll say something along the lines of, wow, when I watch the news, you know, it's kind of crazy. Your country seems, you know, off the wall. And then I watch your videos and I get a totally different outlook on the yeah. people who live in the United States. So I think it's, it's a really good opportunity for guys like you and me, anybody's a storyteller, to really show a different side of the United States. Yeah, I think that's really cool. I think um, I've always wanted to focus on the people and the humans, not just the accomplishments, the numbers, the stats, whatever, because it is the people and we can learn from each other and grow from each other. And that's really the secret sauce, I think. And so it's I, I, I did watch um, all your monumental videos, uh, obviously, to get ready for this one. So I did get a chance to kind of see, you know, your storytelling aspect. And I really enjoyed it. Very well done. And I, I took note that um, you asked quite a few people what they love about bikepacking. So I thought I'd take this opportunity to ask you the same question. I love bikepacking because I connect more with myself. I connect more with the humans around me. I connect more with nature. You know, those are the three things that always happen no matter where I am in the world riding my bike. And I would say it's it's those things. And of course, I can expand a lot on those three things, but I want to keep it short. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know it's hard to, you know, fit everything we think and feel into like a podcast, but you know, mm -hmm. uh, what was next? Oh, just a fun one. I'm watching your videos. I'm like, this dude is like half cyclist half video producer half gymnast with you know <laughs> you know filming while you're riding and particularly on the monumental loop do you have any notion of how many times you've wrecked while trying to film <laughs> i've actually i'm pretty careful i mean i've fallen down a couple times and when i when i film with the drone people think that i have it like on some automatic setting but i'm actually flying it manually as i'm pedaling so that's the most dangerous part when I'm filming because I'll be pedaling slowly with the controller in my hand kind of like I'm playing a video game looking down to make sure I'm getting a good shot but also making sure I'm not going to crash <laughs> that is insane it's even deeper than I realized so like paint you know help me understand I'm super curious like I've thought about getting into YouTube but I mean podcasting is way easier I mean even like recording this then editing it with video is way more complicated so I'm trying to picture you like producing this and do the monumental loop. How much harder is it to like film it and capture it? I'm kind of used to it by now, but it's definitely a lot of effort. Cause you'll see I'm stopping, I'm setting up the tripod, I'm hitting record, I'm running back to my bike. I get on the bike, I ride in front of the camera and I do that yeah. over and over and over. And then I do the drone shots and then I interview people. Then I talk to myself. You know, then I get, you know, nice shots of flowers or, you know, texture shots of things around. And it's a lot of work for sure. So when I'm on a bike ride, the bike riding is, you know, 60% of it, 40% of it is, is really capturing the, the, the ride and the moments. And it's, it's hard to get all the moments, you know, a beautiful sunset or a, a rainstorm or the hardest thing to do is to film when you're physically exhausted. The last thing you want to do is deal with cameras but if you don't get those moments then it's really hard to tell the story you know watching your videos that's one thing i really respected is i mean to really tell the story it takes a lot of work and uh on top of just writing the monumental loop which is hard enough you're actually producing a four-part series that you know turned out 
Excellent. So I just wanted to nod my hat and say that I appreciate, you know, your hard work because I don't know if people always understand how much, you know, riding past the camera and all that stuff you have to do. People have no clue. Viewers are like, make more videos, make more videos. And I'm like, (laughs) people, I'm, this is a lot of work. Like not only is it work when I'm out there, but then I come home and spend a ton of time editing these videos. Right. Yeah. A hundred percent. Well, content to creator to content creator, much props to you. I really appreciate what you're putting out there um, and keep it coming. So let's uh, switch it over to the danger bird, which is held on the monumental loop. But um, we all met there, Matt, and we'll get a chance to let Matt talk here in a second, but uh, I got a chance to meet you there. You rode uh, the danger bird, obviously to create this, this series. Um, Why, why the danger bird? What put it on your radar? Matt here uh, wrote me through Instagram about six months ago. And he said, hey man, I know you love the desert. I know you love Mexican food. I think you might like this ride that we're putting on. And he said, you should come do it. And at that point it was six months out and my schedule's always you know, up in the air. And I'm like, I can't commit now, but I would love to if I'm free. And then fast forward six months and I looked at my calendar, I was free. And I made my way down there and I'm so glad that I did because it was an amazing experience. Wonderful. Well, Matt, why don't you uh, tee it up and let us know? I mean, again, you've been on the podcast before and we've talked about this, but um, so this could be a standalone episode. What is the monumental loop and the danger bird? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Real quickly, I would like to say I (laughs) I invited her. I do know. I invited Ryan because I'd watched his videos for years and I knew they were amazing. And he's always talking about beans and green chili and meeting <laughs> nice people. And I'm like, we have all of that down here. Yeah. Uh, he just rode the, the tour divide and it was like New Mexico section. So lovely. And it's wonderful. I'm like, well, I'll come back and do a little more. So that's why I invited Ryan. Yeah. It wasn't just sort of out of the blue. Like I didn't know who he was. <laughs> like I've been watching his videos for years and loved him. So Anyway, so the Monumental Loop, the new, the new version, uh, version 2.0, is 257 miles of almost entirely dirt that connects the four units of Oregon Mountains Desert Peaks National Monument, uh, some trails, some dirt roads, and sort of highlights everything that makes Doniana County a lovely place to live and, and to visit. Yeah. And uh, how hard would you say in your estimation the danger bird is? <laughs> My estimation is garbage. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I thought this new one was much easier than the old one, and I, th- I still think that's true. Um, but a lot of people found it more difficult than I expected. Part yeah. of that was we had a big monsoon season, so some of the roads got some damage um, and flash floods. Some of the sand was sort of on its worst behavior. There, during this, uh, during this October. Um, so it was a little harder than I expected for some people, but yeah, I, I rated it as a 6.5 on bikepacking.com. I don't know. Those ratings are a joke, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it is because like you say, road, uh, surfaces change. Is it going to be hot? Um, yeah. how windy is it going to be? You know, like this year, the wind was, was insane. Um, I wanted to get, I just held my first event and, you know, you put on an event and you have your own ideas about how hard you think it is or how challenging and and what people would think. But, um, you know, you have someone here in Ryan that just finished your ride. Do you have any, uh, any questions that you might want to ask him? I just wanted to say, first of all, I think you did an incredible job with the event. It wasn't just the bike ride. It was the community. It was the people. I usually ride solo or at least with one person when I'm out there. So it's a pretty solitary experience. But this was the first time I was like, it felt like a running race at a start line, you know, hundreds of people. The energy was amazing. And that really carried through for the whole experience. Did it meet your expectations coming in? And, you know, were there parts of it that were that that didn't fit or didn't didn't flow with the course or parts that you would want to change in some way Uh, i really i enjoyed a lot of it i mean and it it brought back a lot of memories from the baja divide which i absolutely love you know and there's like lots of different scenery the oregon mountains are stunning the single track on the first day depending which direction you go is incredible through the oregon mountains 
I really just, I loved it. And then, yeah, it goes through Hatch that has great food and other towns that have food. And uh, it was a good mix of, of everything, really. It was. You know, I even liked, you know, the Southern Loop. Some people were saying, oh, the Southern Loop isn't as good as the Northern Loop. But I really enjoyed the Southern Loop. You know, you're, you feel a little bit more out there. And uh, that's a fun experience. And especially I camped at the Kilbourne Hole, the crater. And that was a, a beautiful place to camp, you know, right next to a giant volcanic crater where supposedly the Apollo 11 astronauts trained down there. And so it was fun to be be in an area where there's some, you know, serious history. Yeah, for sure. Ryan, so I, I asked Matt what he would rate it. I th I think six and a half is a little uh, lower than what I would rate it. What, what do you think? <laughs> and I haven't I seen am... the whole thing, I should say. I haven't seen the whole thing, but I got a pretty good taste through your videos and I've been out there a couple of times. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Six is probably right on. I just did the Colorado Trail this summer, which was extremely difficult. So this was definitely way easier than the Colorado Trail, no doubt about interesting, it. Interesting, interesting. The Colorado Trail's a nine. So, I mean, like, again, those numbers are kind of interesting. It's hard to tell. But, you know, I, I think five or six is fine. I think anybody can do it. And also, the difficulty really depends on how hard you're pushing. If you go slow, anything's going to be doable. If you go super right. fast, yeah, you're going to you're gonna grind yourself, and it's going to be hard. If it's super windy, yeah, it's... There's a lot of different factors, but it's, I would say anybody out there listening, it's a very doable, you know, four day bike packing adventure. Yeah. Yeah. There are some, there are some difficult sections like white gap by itself, white gap pass. If that was the whole thing, then it would be a 10 because it's, you know, you're pushing over pumpkin sized rocks for a couple hours. Uh, but that's a 12 mile section. And then you've got after that, basically 40 miles of, you know, kind of jamming back to town. Yeah, I guess whenever Ryan put it like that compared to the Colorado Trail, it would almost like Colorado Trail is probably doing like 10 of white, uh, white gap pass, maybe, you know, <laughs> a day, 10 a day, the Colorado 10 a Trail. Day. <laughs> and that's when I made the original route. I, I said the 350 mile version, I said it was a 6.5 because I'd just come off the Colorado Trail, which I found extremely difficult too. Um, yeah. I think it's just is hard. <laughs> So I was having a conversation with, we just went bikepacking this past weekend and, uh, the lady it's, it's a known route it's published in Texas and it's, it's only a 66 mile route. So it's a beginner friendly, just nice overnighter. And the lady at the, that runs this campsite, she was telling us about all these people that were dropping out, mm -hmm. you know, that would, that would get there on night one and call someone to pick them up the next day, or they'd start out on the next day and then they'd come back home. And I started to try to come to terms with like, how hard is bikepacking? You know, like if you're going to describe to somebody who is getting into bikepacking, like how hard is it, you know, and we're talking about these rating systems and they're very ambiguous because we're all at different levels, you know, so. I, I would say it's harder than it looks in the pretty pictures that you see online, uh, bikepacking is. And it's also harder than backpacking. So if you have experience backpacking, you think, well, I'll do the same trail and it'll be, I'll be faster because I'm on my bike. And that's not always even the case. So I think it's harder than it seems. Yeah. Cause then you have mechanicals that could come in, you have extra weight. It's just more, more to deal with. And I think a lot of people don't ride a heavy loaded bike until the day they start the trip, you know, so they're right. not familiar with how that handles and how much more energy that takes. Um, so I'd say load your bike up and ride it around for weeks or months before you even go on a trip. Yeah, I think that's excellent advice. One of the worst things I see people do is train on a road bike. They'll get in all these interval trainings and all this stuff. I'm like, no, nah, man, load, you know, just load your bike down and learn how to go slow. Teach yourself yeah. some patience. You know, I think patience is a big one. Yeah. It can be frustrating to see the pretty picture, the pretty video and, and think you're going to have this marvelous adventure. Right. And then you get out there, it's harder than you think and something goes wrong. And I think, you know, it's definitely taught me, well, I'm a pretty patient guy, but it kind of reinstates that it's like, okay, it's a good thing I'm patient <laughs> because I need it. <laughs> and also problem solving. It's constant problem solving. You know, when you're out there, depending on the route, let's say it's a desert route, like the monumental one, 
you, you're thinking about where am I going to get water next? Where's my next resupply? You know, I got to like keep, you know, salt in my body or I'm going to bonk and you're, you're navigating. And there's just a lot of things on your mind throughout the day when, when you're on a bike packing trip, you know, then I got to find a nice flat place to camp or you, whatever. There's, there's a lot to figure out constantly when you're on an adventure, but that's the exciting part of it, at least for me, you know? Yeah, it it is. I mean, even from, you know, Matt creating a route, the the problem solving aspect of actually creating a route and then to actually go out and ride it and ground truth it and all that stuff, it's a huge problem. And for people who like to take on a challenge, uh, it's a lot of fun. But I, 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 this was just on my mind recently, so it just kind of came up naturally, but I just wanted to kind of put that out there and maybe give some people advice that, you know, we, you do watch videos and, uh, look at p pictures and listen to podcasts and stuff. And, um, it's, it's a little bit harder than I think people may realize. And it takes a lot of skill sets, uh, to, to complete, I don't know, any more thoughts and tips for, uh, for newbies getting into it? I always veterans. tell people, people email me all the time and ask questions about this stuff. I always tell people, start small, do an overnighter, you know, know what it's like to deal with all your equipment and how to get your tent out and maybe how to do some mechanic work on your bike. And so go small. But if you're like, if you watch some Great Divide videos and you're like, I'm going to do the Great Divide, 2,700 miles, no problem. And you could get out there in the first few days, you're completely overwhelmed. Then yeah, it's going to be a tough thing to to accomplish so start small and work up to it i tend to tell people ride a trail that you've ridden in the past and then just do it with your gear uh, and then i think that shows okay normally i ride this you know 20 mile section in two hours and then when they do it with their gear they're like oh that took me three hours it just everything just takes longer you're taking more pictures you're slowing down more you're having snacks it's going to be a lot slower than you thought and i've seen that cause people a lot of stress like ryan said you head out on the tour divide two days in you're 100 miles behind schedule and then you're just sort of you know you're you're stressing yourself out you're like oh i'm not where i'm supposed to be i'm behind i need to go faster and then it just sort of builds on itself until it's so stressful that you're not having any fun and you quit um so ideally give yourself way more time than you think i mean plan a 20 mile day or 30 mile day or something that seems way too short right to start and then, and then go from there. I think that's to, like this route that I just did was 33 miles each day. And I think in most people's estimation, you're like, oh, I could ride that in an afternoon. Right. And they probably think it's not that big of a deal, but man, you just put all that weight on your bike and you're not used to it. And all of a sudden you're out there for five, six hours and you're, you're more drained. You've lost more salt electrolytes and you know, you're not used to that. So next day you wake up with cramps or whatever. So Yeah. Good advice. Uh, the only other thing I would add, and if y'all have any others, I please feel free. But um, even like I, I've always uh, tested equipment in my backyard or in my house or whatever before I take it in the field. Um, get used to setting up your tent. Even I, I sleep my, when I got into hammock camping and I was not sure if I was going to like hammock camping. I slept in my backyard a bunch just trying to figure out before I actually took it, you know, out into the field. You know, tips. What about Matt? I got one for you. What about let's say a a, a relatively you know a new bike packer, first time backpacker, bike packer wanted to come out and do a portion of the monumental loop. Do you have a do you have a route that you would recommend and and even a time frame? If they wanted to do some portion of it, yeah, yeah. I I guess the thing that I prefer, this is what I'd like to have happen is when people message me or call me before they do it. So I can talk about talk them through everything because a lot of people show up and they're like, Oh, I was on my gravel bike and it didn't work out. and That was horrible. And I just see those pictures after the fact. So right. I think a lot of route developers would prefer you just contact us ahead of time. i make custom routes for people all the time. They're like, I only have 35 millimeter tires and I have two days but I want to do the monumental loop. So I gently say, well, here's this other suggestion, make them a custom route that hits some of the same, some of the same cool stuff. And then, you know, sort of get that feedback after. But so if somebody wanted to come do something, I've got routes all over the monument that aren't the monumental loop, but sort of have that same feel um, for every skill level. 
you know, so yeah. that's the number one tip for me is contact the route maker see what the conditions are like currently see if there's anything they can say about your bike setup that would be helpful about how long yeah. how long it generally takes just get as much information from the from the locals as possible well hats off to you man because um i agree with you 100 percent. and as a route creator myself i would i would you know holler at me i've made custom routes i just made one this weekend this past weekend for someone um but I think a lot of route creators, not, I don't know, I don't want to classify how many, but, um, you know, a lot, you, you see often that routes are just put up, the information isn't updated. There isn't someone like actively behind it that you can contact and talk about resupply points or all this stuff. And with the monumental loop, that's not the case at all because of you. Uh, you are very uh, accessible and passionate about it and, you know, you want people to have the right information. So I echo what you're saying. Yeah. I think if you're going to put a route out there, that's part of it. Putting the route right. out is the start of the journey of having people come ride your route. And for me, that's been like a six or seven year thing now. And I'm doing, you know, going to meetings with the BLM and meeting with the city and doing all these things that I don't really care to do that much, but it's advancing sort of the, the route. Um, so I think that's all part of it. So it, it looks cool to say, oh, I have a route on bikepacking.com, but that's sort of day one of all this responsibility, really, that you've signed up for. And I guess I take that seriously. And I like helping people, you know, like Ryan said, I like helping people get out there and challenge themselves and see new things. And this is sort of the way I'm able to do it right now. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's really cool. I I just want to emphasize it because maybe, you know, people see routes on bikepacking.com and they're nervous to ask the person a question. But in your case, I would, I, I know for a fact, I know people who you've made custom routes for and uh, you're always kind and generous with your time to make sure that uh, people have a good time out there on their bike. So Matt, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to talk a little bit about the actual uh, bikepacking summit that was taking place before the danger bird. Um, this was your sixth year to hold the Danger Bird, is that right? Ish. Uh, it was the or, fourth. Oh, it's close. Excuse I was only me, like yeah. two off. <laughs> yeah, good enough. <laughs> good enough. The fourth. Oh, you created it six years ago, and then this was the fourth right. uh, actual race. Yeah. Okay. I knew there was a six in there somewhere, but this was the first year you did the New Mexico Bikepacking Summit, and obviously it was there. But um, from your perspective, you know, what did you what did you want the Bikepacking Summit to be, and in, in, in looking in the rears, you know, how do, how do you think it went? Uh, I think it went great. Uh, what I wanted it to be was sort of a, a conversation starter and as like a celebration also of what New Mexico has going on and where we want to take bikepacking in the state. Um, right. So we had several bike manufacturers and bag makers and you know, people in the industry sort of meet in the morning who are all based in the state and they sort of showed what they were doing with gear, with bikes, with different art things um, related to bikes, just to show how much is already going on here, not only to the bike packing community, but also to like the broader community, um, people who aren't aware of all these makers in the state and what's what's really happening. I think a lot of people in New Mexico see bike packing as sort of a fringe thing that only a few people do. But there's people running businesses here, you know, that are pretty successful. Buckhorn Bags and Farewell and several others. I'm like, these guys are, are killing it. And they're all based here in New Mexico. So part of it was God. to sort of celebrate that. And then the second part of the day was how do we grow this to a bigger, more inclusive thing that can that can serve all, you know, more people in New Mexico. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was the first time I'd ever been to an event where, uh, you know, bike, uh, you know, like Ryan said, these are usually pretty solo endeavors, but here you show up with, I mean, you drew in 120 plus bike packers to Las Cruces, New Mexico. And in front of them was the government and other officials. And I, I felt like it was the start of something really good. You know what I'm saying? I felt like it was good that they were seeing us, that they were seeing hopefully the type of people we were, the, ec ec you know, the economic stimulus that we can, we got money. We like bean burritos, right? Yes. Uh, we like green chili and all that stuff. But I mean, I felt like it was something kind of special, you know? Yeah, I, I did too. And it, it, it was more successful than I thought it was going to be. And sort of the ultimate goal moving forward would be 
to sort of replicate what we've done with the Monumental Loop and what that means to the community on a statewide level uh, with something called the New Mexico Bikepacking Network. So it just reaches every little town and, you know, and every, every little restaurant has a chance to participate and everybody sees some of that economic development. And yeah. There are a lot well, of little I, towns in New Mexico. They're cool and funky and really cool places to visit. Nobody's heard of them, but they have bike routes either near or through them already. And like, if yeah. we can just sort of formalize that and get it all in one place, that could, that could benefit a lot of people. Yeah. 100%. I, uh, I enjoy, you know, with my route is putting on those, I look for the most remote. I I've told people like, I want you to come to East Texas. And even if you live in East Texas, I want you to experience it in a way you've never experienced before. I want you to see the parts you've never seen, you know, all of it. And, you know, I think that's kind of one of the fun parts is I, I, this is kind of off topic, but, um, whenever I travel, I always avoid the interstate, you know? Uh, you, all you get on the interstate are big buckies and big gas stations and big trucks and people going fast and I'll go an extra hour to go the back roads and you get people driving slow and you get, you know, I, I don't know. I stop in all kinds of cool, like little gas stations or restaurants and meet all kinds of cool little people. And, um, I like, I just like seeing that side of the world more than the, the fast interstate world that's just buzzing by so fast. Me too, but Bucky's is pretty cool. You got to give it to yeah. Bucky's. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, I do like Bucky's, but Bucky's needs to recognize that they need to they need to step up and get off of the interstate and just do one in like some random ass like little town. I think that would be pretty sick. They got Hold the money. Here, they guys. Could... I have no idea what Bucky's is. <laughs> okay, I, well, go ahead, Matt. I want to hear because I'm a Texan. I know what they are. I mean, I, I only rarely go, but it's like a gas station destination, I guess is what oh. I would call it. Like a superstore gas station. It's got it. It's got everything. I mean, it's food, got a food court and stuff. Yeah, exactly. It's just a huge. Oh, yeah, they it's, make... got a, it's got a cute little Bucky Beaver <laughs> sort of logo. That's that's fun. <laughs> nice. It's it's a it's essentially like a super Walmart. That's a gas station. You know, they have their own barbecue stuff. They sell you know, barbecue pits and they sell like deer feeders and deer blinds and clothing and ice chest uh -huh. and all kinds of crazy stuff. Anyway, they're, they're just, it's just Texas, you know, it's like, okay, how can we make the biggest, most obnoxious gas station? But listen, they always have the lowest prices, the cleanest gas, uh, cleanest bathrooms, and they have like a 1 million pump. So you can always find a place to get gas. So they do have their benefits. I bet. You could do a whole podcast on Bikepacker's favorite gas stations. Oh, yeah. We should, actually. I, I know I, Matt. I don't know if you guys have ever been to Casey's in the Midwest. Casey's are my favorite gas stations. Uh, uh, I, I, grew, I grew up in Iowa. My brother still is a big, big, all his rides are planned around where are the Casey's. So. Casey's are great. They make awesome pizza. You can walk into the beer coolers and, like, cool off on a hot summer day. Yeah, I love Casey's. Awesome. All right, Matt, what was yours? Did we visit yours when we rode on the Monumental Loop this year? Yeah, I mean, the best version of it is that Pickwick and Hatch. Mm. Um, but there's Pickwicks all over the route. Uh, I think they're going to be sold. I just heard the other day they're going to be sold to Circle K or something. Mm. Though. Oh, so no. It's kind of like a big, big shakeup on the Monumental Loop here. Whoa. Well, hopefully it's for I the better. You'll the, first, the first time I rode the Monumental Loop, we got to Hatch, and it was 80 miles in at that point. It was the much harder version. And we spent three hours sitting in the booth at Pickwick, just like eating snacks and recovering. And it was a, kind of an amazing experience, you know, talking to the people that work there and the customers coming in saying, what are y'all doing? And it really was three <laughs> hours in a booth at, at a gas station. Yeah. And it, for some reason, was one of the highlights of, of that ride. But <laughs> yeah, was it, I, well, if they get... gas stations, I love gas stations are, are really important. <laughs> <laughs> Said the guy who's never had a car. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's impressive. Ryan, what were your, uh, did you have any takeaways from the, uh, the actual summit portion of the event? I know I, I saw you there for the, uh, the talks, I think, or were you, did yeah, you not was, make it? I got there Friday afternoon, so I missed most of the summit, especially the makers part, which I would have loved. Um, but yeah, it was, it was interesting to sit and, and listen to some of the locals, uh, local, uh, governmental people in Las Cruces talk about, how they want to build up tourism in in the area and also focus on getting 
I think they talked about this, you know, lower income, young people out uh, doing, you know, outdoor activities and the importance of that and uh, being respectful to the to the native populations in New Mexico. So I, I found it uh, educational for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it was nice to see all that synergy between, you know, bike packers and, and, and the government really, you know, I mean, it's really cool. And, you know, hats off to Matt here because he's the guy who picked up the phone and started knocking on doors. And I'll be honest, I would never think to knock on a Senator's door or any, any type of official, you know, um, it's just not on my radar. Uh, Matt, what's next for, uh, what are you thinking for next year? More of the same? Know. Bigger, better, batter? Is it too early? No, it's not too early. We had a meeting uh, of all the people. We call it the board of directors. We're not really, or the stewards of shred. It's sort of our, when we're being (laughs) cool, that's what we call ourselves. Uh, We had a meeting last week and nobody knows what we're going to do. I kind of, honestly, I kind of go back and forth between that was it and it was amazing and we'll never do it again. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think that's the case. I think we will do the danger bird again. Um, but I don't know what shape it's going to take. If there will be a summit or not, I'm not sure. Well, I know for a fact my audience got all psyched up about it. So <laughs> you better do it. <laughs> <laughs> People have been coming since the Danger Bird happened. There's been somebody on the route pretty much every day since then. So people are still riding the route and using it. And that's cool. Um, that's awesome. What I really want to see is like some local high school outdoor club or like they were saying, like Brian just mentioned, some sort of. You know, somebody besides a bunch of white dudes that are already adept at bikepacking go out there. Like a local group of kids say, hey, I this route is in my community. I want to ride it. That's like my version of success for the route. When the local folks get excited about it and they go out there and use it with their families, with their friends. That's what I, but I don't know exactly how to make that happen. I think so. you already are. I mean, you've created it. And I know actually from Ryan watching Ryan's video that you were talking to a local, I think that wrote it for the first time. And I believe I met a local that was writing it for the first time too. So maybe it just took them a little while to get on board, but I don't know. What are, are you starting to see a little more interest from the community? Yeah. Once I made it way more reasonable, people, <laughs> people got, people got into it. The old version was just like, nobody was that excited. I mean, they knew about it and they liked it. They like the idea of it, but now it's hitting, you know, it's hitting Blue Moon Bar and places in Hatch and a little food truck in Vinton and Rovato. I'm like, so those people sort of have a familiarity with it and they want to, they want to see it succeed. So, yeah. How the, uh, how the tandem riders do two butts, one bike. They did great. They did great. They finished it. They finished it. I think in five days. Yeah. Awesome. And they nice. said it yeah, was, was a little, a little beyond what they maybe were capable of, but they didn't have any trouble. Good. Good. Well, like we said, if a tandem can do the Colorado trail, then this is out there too for tandems. Yeah. Now we had a a specific question for you. Mike from Instagram asked, has anyone, or is it practical to run the Southern loop backwards and use the word run? So I don't know if that's literal run or, you know, anyway, go ahead. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> short answer is Perfect. yes i've ridden i've ridden both loops in both directions um it's better in the just the direction the southern loop specifically is better in the direction that it's mapped out because you go downhill on the single track on sierra vista but it's not that big of a hill it's sort of just a gradual grade so you can do the figure eight in almost any direction you want to running or riding running for sure yeah. just do whatever you want out there but cool yeah, I might come and run it some year. That'd be cool. Whoa. Yeah, I'd love that. Well, Ryan, what would that look like? I am not a runner. I know Matt's <laughs> got some through hiking experience, but uh, you know, what what does that look like? So running it's like bike know. packing, but without a bike. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, you know, uh runners call it fast packing, where you have, you know, a backpack that's pretty small and hugs you pretty tight, so you just not bouncing all over the place with gear. But yeah, you still need like a bivy and a sleeping pad and, and the gear you need to sleep out at night and uh, nutrition and stuff like that. And you just run, you know, and uh, it's obviously it's very hard to carry gear on your back when you're running. But a, a, a couple people did it this past year, right, Matt? 
Yeah, two yeah. people fin- two people finished. Uh, Ella Raff from Washington. She had run it before, and she did a little bit faster this time. And then Peter Livingstone, uh, local. And the runner's route is 305 miles, so it's still sort of that longer, harder version. And he did it in, I don't know, six days or five days and some hours, so almost as fast as a bike would be, which is incredible. But Yeah, that's crazy. Ryan, that's what I was kind of curious is, can you compare it, uh, you know, this ultra running to ultra distance cycling is one harder or easier about the same all comes out on the wash. What? Uh, I would say running is way harder. Like an ultra running race is extremely difficult. You don't the get the downhill. Yeah. The depths that I dive in an ultra race at mile 80 are much more painful than even anything on the Colorado trail. Um, but it's, it's totally different, you know? Uh, yeah. Bikes, the downhills are amazing, but the uphills kind of suck. But when you're running, the uphills aren't that bad, you know, but, uh, it, it's just, it's completely different. I mean, I've been a runner all my life. So I actually, I'm, I'm very comfortable running long distances. Um, but, uh, you know, if I'm going to like go out and do something in nature, for many days at a time it's usually going to be on a bike because let's face it riding a bike is more fun than running <laughs> amen <laughs> we can all agree on that <laughs> we can all agree on that you know i like the challenge of running for sure but bikes are way more fun there's, there's plenty of running races that i've done single track through beautiful forest and i'm like i wish i was on my bike right now <laughs> yeah so Ryan, I, I wanted to give you an opportunity. I gave Matt one, but I mean, uh, you wrote his route. Uh, did you have any lingering questions or curse words for him? Sounds like, you know, bike packing is relatively easy for you compared to your ultra running. So it's probably why you're always smiling when you're on your bike. <laughs> yeah, I really, I loved how he tied in the, the, the little towns and stuff. Matt mentioned really briefly, there's an amazing taco truck in a tiny town called El Vado, which is in the Southern Loop. And those are some of like the best beans I've ever had in my life. Maybe it's because I was starving, maybe not. But the the woman working in the taco truck was super awesome. Um, I, I really enjoyed the entire experience. You know, I, I love New Mexico. I love the people. I've ridden my bike a lot in New Mexico. And this was a different uh, view of it for me. And uh, I feel very fortunate that I, I made it down there and that Matt invited me. As far as like ideas to change or i don't i can't really think of anything i mean i really enjoyed it i mean how many bike packing you know routes have serious single track there's not a lot most of the times you're on like dirt roads which is fine but this route has a lot of single track that's really fun i just wish we had more single track um, yeah. the main issue now is the, and in the national monument uh, when they designated it, they designated for some reason in that language, it got included that there would be no new bike trails in the monument. Um, so right now I'm just sort of looking at places just outside of the monument to sort of work with the BLM to build some more single track. And there is some that isn't included on the loop. that's like adjacent to the route, um, which used to be included in the harder version. But yeah, more single track would be awesome. Yeah. Would you uh, make it mandatory single track and change the route or optional? Like, you know, Arkansas High Country has that optional single track. Yeah, I almost put on, there's a place where you go around the southern end of the Robledo Mountains um, as you come back into Cruces on like the second or third day. And it's kind of a sandy road. And there's a single track option through those mountains, which I have not yet put on the map, but I sort of would like to. Um, There's a gnarly trail through there. I think it's kind of a cool way to do it personally. I mean, it's almost like, uh, you know, cross country mountain biking where there's an A line and a B line or whatever. You can, you know, take the harder one if you're feeling up for it. And if not, you can just take the, take the gravel or sand road or whatever it is. Yeah. I'd sort of like people to see the loop, not as like direction, but sort of as a suggestion of where to start. And then from there, you can piece together other little sections and add in more of what you want. You know, if you wanted to stop and do some hikes, there's some places where that would be. I think a great way to, to add to your trip or add some more single track. It's hard. Yeah. What I really need to do is make like a guidebook or some sort of website. Mm-hmm. So all that information can be on one place instead of just, you know, some, some random Instagram post about it. But it's a, it's a lot of work. 
I just wish there was a monumental loot fund where people could go and support you. And dude, <laughs> I don't even know what to say about that. I, I, honestly, I'm like blown away. Like your whole reaction and all the posts you did after, and you weren't the only one. Um, people just wanted to support the route, and I'm still a little bit conflicted about that. I don't, I don't know what I would do with that money. I'm just a guy, so it seems weird. I'm not a nonprofit, so it seems weird to be giving me money. But uh, I'm super grateful. And yeah, that, those are sort of some of the things we're working, working towards It's like a guidebook or some sort of program to buy kids bikes to help them get out there. Yeah. I don't know. No, you know? That, well, that's the thing, man. It, it, you don't have to have a perfect, I think a deal of, I think where that money goes, I think, you know, my thought was, is look at what this guy has done with very little resources and money and, and stuff, and you've just made it work. And so, you know, what if we had a little walk around change in your pocket? What would you do with that? And, you know, my thought is, is I know you would do something good with it. And I think um, hopefully the community feels the same way, you know, and, and it's as simple as that, you know, no big deal. Matt, I'm all about getting kids on bikes. I am part of a foundation that gives money to groups that get kids on bikes. So whenever you get this organized, let me know. We'll, uh, we'll give you some money. I appreciate <laughs> it. I appreciate it. The, the first thing we're going to have to do if we have the danger bird next year is get permits from the BLM. They were very satisfied with how it went. Uh, nobody left a trace. It was, it was fantastic. All the BLM, People were, were pleased with how it went. They were amazed with how careful and thoughtful everybody was with the land. But we are going to need to get permits next year, which means insurance and a bunch of other things that cost money. So some of the money will immediately go to that. But thinking bigger, I, I would certainly like to, to just give kids bikes. I mean, yeah. wouldn't that be like the coolest thing to do? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. That's what I love giving kids bikes. So you let me know when you get that set up. I love giving kids bikes, too. <laughs> giving, giving of any kind giving of any kind is like just the best thing in life isn't it absolutely it is thank you for giving us this uh amazing experience matt we honestly couldn't be out there enjoying it without all your efforts ryan i know you gotta probably head i gotta go in five minutes five minute warning five minute all right warning. five minute warning uh does anybody have anything serious to talk about or i got a listener question that would just be fun Let's do a fun one. All right. Listener question from Dr. Your Face. Dr. You're My Face. <laughs> have any of <laughs> have any of you ever barfed on a ride? And I will say I barfed on uh, one weekend ago on a bike ride and start off the day and uh, just, I, I guess my food didn't settle very well before I got going. And about five miles in, I just had to let it go. And I kept on, kept on going. I was fine. But yeah. Barfing's no big deal. Go ahead, Matt. I have Matt. never barfed. All right. <laughs> I, I'm lucky. I'm not a big barfer. Back in my drinking days, even when I'd get super wasted, I never threw up. So I, I'm just, yeah, I keep it in. I got to keep those calories in. That's the right way to do it. I was definitely suffering uh, the rest of the day as a result, but, you know, I got a weak constitution, I guess. <laughs> Uh, yes, I have barfed. Uh, and it's another reason why I like sand. It's a good barfing receptacle. <laughs> it's easy to just like scratch a little hole, barf and cover it up and move on. Uh, during, I think it was like the 2019 danger bird, maybe I, I had a barfing incident at like <laughs> one in the one in the morning or something. Oh man, that's the worst when you have to wake up and uh and barf. we were still awake we were right we were still riding oh. at one in the morning yeah i made I made oh, okay some barfed. yeah awesome but not well, alcohol gentlem- related. it's worth yeah. noting also no alcohol no alcohol i like to say that and i think ryan you also are not a drinker yep it's been six years yeah i mean i'm three years in it's uh, there's a lot of like bikes are tied to beer a lot mm-hmm. and alcohol and drinking after and i sort of want to you know any chance i get to say that those two should be a little more disconnected. And I like to say that. So, yeah, right on. I, it's the best decision I've ever made in my life. Yeah. I hear you. I think I'm going to go have a drink. (laughs) (laughs) And I don't (laughs) judge people who drink, you know, not at all. For me personally, only positive results have come from quitting alcohol. Yeah. You got to find your own path and, 
I, I agree. I do think, I mean, even though I do drink, I, I don't think that drinking should go hand in hand with bike packing per se, but throwing up, I do think Ryan, I think you need to get in on the, uh, throwing up and bike packing, <laughs> barfing and bike packing. It's like the next greatest I mean, thing. I don't even throw up in hundred mile ultra races. So if I'm yeah. not throwing up during running races, I doubt bike packing is going to push me to the limit. Yeah, either. you're fine. You're tough. <laughs> All right, guys. I appreciate your time so much. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Loved it. <laughs> Thanks for having me back. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, guys. Y'all have a good one. Appreciate right. it. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Peace yeah. out. Cheers. Oh, yeah. And I think that I'm supposed to tell you to like and subscribe if you like this content. And also share with your friends. Because sharing is caring. All right, everybody. Thanks again for tuning in to today's episode. I really appreciate Ryan. I really appreciate Ryan and Matt coming on, sharing the love of bike packing, sharing the stoke. Both these guys have put in a tremendous amount of effort to tell the stories of bike packing or create routes so that people like Ryan and I can go out and ride them want to thank both of these guys for helping to grow and establish a better bikepacking future for everybody. And you heard me mention towards the end a monumental loot fund. If you'd like to support the work that Matt Mason and everybody over there in Southern New Mexico is doing, you can find out how over at patreon.com forward slash monumental loop. Well, that's all I have for you today. If you like this kind of content, don't forget to like and subscribe and Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. Now go ride your damn bike.